Hello everyone, welcome back to episode 21 of Night Call, and I think today we're going to finish it. The problem is, we all know these people. I suppose he will want to go to a TV station. I don't know, I guess he won't have a different story for us now. Okay, so it was more of the same, so we already had this. I think it was very, very early on that we drove him. <sighs> Who's next? He's the he's the hacker guy, I think. Will he tell us something different now? I don't want to drive Neri again. I don't want to drive them again. Evie never pays and... yeah. Oh no, no, it's not the hacker guy, it's Sonny. Ugh. Yeah, he will still think we're a swell guy. Whatever. So, we're still a swell guy. That's what Sonny told us. Also, he gave us some clues. Is she gonna talk about the billabong again? I just really don't want to drive FV because... It's always the same now, first. And second, he never pays. Let's see if there's a billabong here, too. Well, to Boulogne, of course. They're out. I don't want to miss them. Who are they? Ah, uh, let's just start driving. It doesn't matter with her. You notice your passenger relax as soon as the car starts to move. She doesn't seem the least bit interested in your presence. What are we gonna do in Boulogne? We are going to gather truffles. You look at her out of the corner of your eye. Truffles to eat? Well, of course not. Food is poison, is dead weight that stifles thought. I wouldn't say that. I like food. We need to move beyond the idea that the stomach is king. She closes her eyes. After I rode one potato in 2003, I stopped eating vegetables. Seriously, I just couldn't eat what I'd written anymore. And after that, I began to free myself from the shackles of sweets and cooking. Poetry is where we come from, where our true values lie. In a combination of words, not oils. In cooking syllables, not meat. Are you one of those vegans? fair question, although she doesn't even eat potatoes, then I don't know. She's far more than a vegan. Really? Is she just living from light and love? I don't know. You never eat? Of course I do. What a silly question. Eating is important. What now? Make a decision. But I want to do so in harmony with nature, of which we are a part. You don't know how, but you actually heard the capital N in nature. <laughs> That's why I ingest only tea and rocks from my own garden. What the hell? She eats rocks? You're speechless. She goes on without noticing your surprise. Not to mention truffles to open my mind. When I'm stuck... She raises a hand. No, not stuck. Unable to give birth to a new idea. When the contractions don't come, that is a strange metaphor. When my mind is not fully dilated, then truffles help. You're almost to the Bois de Boulogne, by day it is not much of a forest. At night even less so, scattered groves, a few unlit roads. Of course there are all the sex workers with the trailers and trucks, but their clients are not interested in having company. Keep driving, it's a little further on the right. You sigh. You almost never come to this area except to pick up your friend Jackie. An idea pops into your head. For once, you get the impression that the Bois de Boulogne is more hospital than, hospitable than Paris. No killers on the loose, no police on your trail. You're taken by a sudden desire to leave your passenger there and speed off towards the Atlantic coast. Stop. I sense them. Oh wow, she's a... truffle... sensing person. She's a superhero. She gets out of the cab and vanishes into the forest. A minute goes by. What if you drive away? She's 500 meters from a metro station. There is no danger. 
Oh, I wouldn't leave her alone anywhere. The door behind you slams. She's back. Oh, shit. Her mouth is full. You can barely make out the address she gives you. <laughs> you turn the key in the ignition and start driving. You glance in the mirror and see your passenger uncomfortably swallow something. You can't help but say in a disgusted voice, What are those things? They're truffles. Those super pricey things that grow in dirt. The, these ones aren't super pricey, as you put it. They just help me right. Are they hallucinogenic? She shakes her head. They help start the contractions. Oh, please stop using this metaphor. They help me focus on my poetry. She shakes her head and says nothing. Maybe the truffles are working? You concentrate on your driving and the road ahead. Boulogne is far behind and you're driving through the nicer neighborhoods in the city. From time to time she whispers something. You catch a word or two here and there. Silence. Augmented. Vivisection. She pronounces each syllable with haughtiness and precision. When you've almost reached your destination, your passenger closes her eyes. Here it comes. Her voice drops and sounds more poised. I hear from across the ocean the tumult of the drowned. Hold your ear to the water. Hey, ra, ra, hey. Dance on the dock where the dinghies dabble. She's silent. She furrows her brow. Ingest. I vomit the carbon I ingest as I sit under in the shade of the chestnut. I attempt to write about the passage of a past passage, but it passes away. Passes away. I'm stabbed by savages. Every once in a while, he shakes uncontrollably. Here we hanged man and woman. In their hearts, they were the mark of the improper paternal figure protruding and pestilent. Pest still lent. I am a slave to my own revenge. Not you, but I. She slowly opens her eyes as you pull over. She smiles at you, a strange smile, like she just had an orgasm. Leave my taxi, lady. Thank you for your patience. She hands you money for the fare and a few white seashells. Oh, what will I be able to buy with seashells, huh? You think I can go to the gas station now and pay my gas price with seashells? Hold on to them. They have... She searches for the word for a few minutes before getting out. They have spatial qualities. You are ready to jump out of your seat. Huh? Spatial? She's already out of the cab and the door softly shuts. I'm glad I don't know what spatial means, so... I guess it was something weird. No doubt about it, she's wearing pajamas. Hmm. Nothing better than taking a walk in the woods in the middle of the night searching for hallucinogenic mushrooms. Wouldn't you agree? <sighs> Why is it so much pointing to LV? Is he giving us... Can he give us information or something? I'm just gonna go for the gas station. Oh. It's our... It's the future woman again, I guess. No, it's Ludwig. This is where I died. You break hard. There's no noise in the cab. No noise outside. Have we seen him again? Yeah, we... This is uh Where? <laughs> Get out! It smells like buttery crust and meat browning in the oven. Oh, it's something different. It smells good, doesn't it? I'm hungry, too. I'm always hungry. Hotel Dieu, please. Okay. Yes, I'm afraid you might think I'm crazy. But I assure you, we'll find sustenance there. The ghost lets out a cute little sigh. There used to be an excellent pastry shop there. The best pâté en croûte in all of Paris. Everyone went there, that's for sure. They closed centuries ago, long before I was born. But they still sell their products in the courtyard of the hospital. The ghosts who live there love to treat themselves to some nice warm pâté before going to their rooms. He giggles. You should see the hospital some nights. No thanks. The dead and the living mingling, walking past each other, conversing sometimes without even realizing. 
many guests. Some areas are natural meeting places. He raises his voice, excited. I know, let's play a game. It will help us forget how hungry we are. All right then, you can ask me one question about myself. Only one. You pause a few seconds, the little ghost is impatient. Go ahead, I'm waiting. How did you die is a kind of a heart. I'm trying to find a murderer. Hey, maybe he knows something. Not now. No, no, it's too early or too late. I'm not sure. He points to something outside. We're not far now. The pastry shop I was telling you about was right behind this wall on the corner of another street. Both streets have disappeared. They were raised and erased when they built the hospital. And I want to tell you something. Oh, any two-bit historian pushing their books on you would know. But they never get the story right. This, the smell from the beginning of the trip returns to tickle your nose. The pate on crude the little ghost was talking about. There once lived two men here, one a barber, the other a pastry maker. One who had a fancy for blood killed his clients, foreigners, people passing through, broke students. The other who fancied the first collected the bodies and chopped them up in the back room of his shop. He added strong spices to this fresh meat, as was typical at the time. He then prepared the pâté for baking. Oh, it was human pâté. He cooked it in a richly buttered crust and sold it to everyone who was anyone in Paris. The little ghost burst out laughing. Have no fear, the pastry chef and his lover have been dead for ages. Once in a while you can catch a glimpse of them in one of the operating rooms at the hospital. They lean over the patient and grab a tender morsel for their pâté on croute. He once again starts to laugh, this time it's a bit darker. That's creepy. No need to make such a face, those are best left of two ghosts. On that note, bon appétit. Oh, I think I lost my appetite. A second later he vanishes. You pull over and take a second to clear your mind of the image of the barber and the pastry maker. Mm -hmm and a delicious taste of meat fresh from the oven coating the inside of your mouth. So who are we gonna drive now? So is it Carlo or is it Macho Guy? I think it's Carlo. I'm gonna drive him. I think I remember his face from somewhere, but I don't know if we have driven him or not. And then we need a gas station. Mathieu Vidal. No, we don't know him. You pick up your client right outside the entrance of a public hospital. He slips into the back seat and blurts out an address in an upscale neighborhood. Everything about him denotes fatigue, voice, face, eyes. Judging by his clothes, you doubt he's a doctor. But you're well aware that appearances can be deceiving. Your eyes meet and you give him a smile. He doesn't respond. The ride begins in silence. In the rearview mirror, you notice your passenger's clenched fist, tight mouth, and twitching eyelids. Let's break the ice. They're good at that hospital. Your words startled him. Uh, excuse me? I was just saying they're good at that hospital. They took care of me a couple of weeks ago. He moves in closer, ever so slightly, as if to better stare at you. Nothing serious, I hope. Oh no, I just got shot. You shake your head, no. Uh, no, nothing serious. He watches you closely for a second and realizes he's said too much. Other silence. You try to read your passenger's thoughts in a rearview mirror. His head dips in a reluctant nod as if, as if hesitant to speak. He moves a hand to his pants pocket, feeling for something. No luck. You're... He breaks off, sorry to have spoken, but his anger wins out. You can sense it beneath the surface, eating away at him. What is he so angry about, you wonder? You're right. The staff at the hospital is excellent. Especially the nurses. The doctors, too. They're young and committed. Pretty unusual for a public hospital. He turns his gaze to the passing street with its Christmas decorations, darkened windows and rare passers-by. You don't let your guard down. I work in the private sector. I'm a gynecologist, but my father... His voice shakes. I can't even begin to tell you. He lowers his gaze. You sense he's gone to some far-off place. 
Then he comes around. The day I graduated from high school, my father shook my hand and said, It's your turn now to try to be as successful as me, but you'll never be a match for me. Widen your eyes. I don't know, the other, the other options seem just so strange. No, widen your eyes. He doesn't like me. He hates me, really. He's always considered me an inferior being, like some kind of parasite, really. He's never forgiven me for going into the private sector. All told, we've talked maybe three, four times in the past six years. Chilling silence. Who reached out first? He usually did. Your passenger's jaw is slowly relaxing. He called to tell me an uncle or cousin had died. Sometimes it was just a pretext to make some new dig. He'd read my name in a magazine, wanted to make fun of one of my clients. He shakes his head. I, I treated a lot of actresses at one point. I... Forget it. He's going to die. He's only got a few days left. Uh, that's why he's in the hospital. Generalized cancer. There's nothing more to be done. His new wife contacted me, asked me to come, so I did. Like a good son. He gives an acid laugh. He called me an idiot and, most, and roasted me in front of the intern. He didn't spare me a single fucking thing. The choices I've made, my life, my work. I grabbed my jacket and walked out. He can die there, all alone. I don't know, I mean, if he had been like this all his life, then I don't think that it's due to the disease that he <laughs> said it to him. So, I'm sorry. That sounds horrible. I... He seems to be taken aback by your thoughtfulness. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. If I'd trusted my gut, I would have... He's unable to contain his anger any longer. I think I'd have gone... He manages to compose himself at last, catching his breath one gulping heave at a time. When he speaks again, the tone of his voice is light and affected. The only thing that men ever gave me was hatred. I don't know what I did to deserve it. I worked hard. Everything I am today, I did it all without his help. He kicked me out of the day I graduated. You can hear the muscles working in his jaw. Was that an account of the disease too? You remain silent. You can see his building at the end of the street. That was the last time I ever saw him, pale and shrunken like a pathetic looking rat. A small lab rat devoured by disease, his skin all shriveled up by the chemo. You park your car. Your passenger hands you the fare. Keep the change. He exits the car and walks away with closing the, without closing the door. His footsteps echo through the quiet street and the door of his building slams shut. A moment or two passes and you get out of the cab to close the car door. You look up at the Kashi apartments. The balconies are well maintained, some turned into greenhouses. You notice a few plants, no doubt, looking forward to summer. You climb back into the car. We haven't met the future people now, so... And we still didn't drive Annabelle. Okay, so we don't have that much to go on anymore. So we're gonna talk to the clerk. Gonna get a clue. And then we're gonna leave. So, we still have the ultra skaters. Is it the same story again? I mean, this took a long time. I think I haven't met him. Why did we? It seems familiar. Like, the name seems familiar. Customer getting into your cab is in his late teens and looks exhausted. Oh wow, he looks shocked. You sense he's nervous, on edge, he's afraid of something. 13th arrondissement, Rue de Choisy. He has a slight drawl and accent from the provinces, maybe Alsace? Somewhere in eastern France, anyhow. You start the cab. A lengthy silence ensues. Smell of your passengers unmistakable. Alcohol, strong and cheap. 
everything all right? The young man is surprised you ask. He doesn't answer right away. His eyes are so strange. Uh, yeah, sure. Sorry, I was kind of zoning out. Problems? Uh, yeah, you could say that. He looks at you at last. Something in his eyes tell you. Can I ask you something? You nod, yes. I, I had a fight with my father. And I took off. Without my wallet or credit card. So where are you heading now? You smell like alcohol. So where are you heading now? Uh, to my mother's. I live at my dad's place because it's closer to high school. But the two of us, we don't get along. Your mother will pay for the ride? Uh, she, she doesn't know I'm coming. I'll have to go up to get the money. She's not answering her phone. You don't believe a word he's saying and he, he can tell you're not buying it. Uh, otherwise, I could... He averts his gaze. I, I was thinking maybe I could... He looks you in the eye again and spreads open his jacket a little. Uh, make you feel better? No thanks! Uh, it must be pretty hard driving like this all alone. Maybe a massage or something else? He breaks off and looks down at his crotch. <laughs> Stop right there! <laughs> Stop the cap. Uh, no, I'm not gonna ask what exactly are you used to No, stop right there. His face turns bright red. Uh, sorry, I... You don't have any money at all. He nods his head no. You sigh. You do stuff like that often? I... Yeah, sometimes. He averts his gaze. It's been complicated lately. I don't have anyone to help me out anymore. Listen, the answer is no for the massage and the anything else. You really can't pay? The young man meets your eye. Yeah, I'm broke. I messed everything up this year. I lost my job at the supermarket. My roommate kicked me out. He seems to be getting younger with each new word. I have a friend who puts me up sometimes. She says I can stay at her place tonight. That's where we're heading. Fine. But don't massage me. I'll drive you. Passenger's eyes widen. He leans in a little closer to you. You will? You're not, yes. But you have to stop doing stuff like that. You're going to get into trouble and cause trouble too. He opens his mouth to say something. I lied to you before. I wasn't at my father's. I was with this guy. I'm a male escort. I spent the night with him. No, 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 he's, ah, I know his, ah, he's one of the suspects. <laughs> Oops. Oof. Thought his face looked familiar. I spent the night with him. We don't, we don't even have sex. It's platonic. He lowers his eyes. He looks unhappy. I really screwed things up. I don't have a place to sleep. You have nowhere to go. I don't know anyone here, only customers. My parents are old farts and I couldn't stand living in Vesu anymore. Have you ever been to Vesu? You shake your head no. Well, don't bother going, bunch of old farts. A little smile flits across his face and disappears. Making fun of Vesu usually cheers me up, but not this time. You sense he's withdrawing again. Do you mind if I take a little nap? We're almost there. Just a few minutes. I'll give myself some time to think. You're not okay. Thanks. Turn up the heat. He smiles at you and looks at the passenger window. You keep driving. Every now and then you glance back at him. He's not asleep, just staring at the road, lost in thought. He loosens his shirt a little. He's not as cold as when he got in the cab. It's as if he were having a conversation with himself, but without pronouncing a single word. As if he were weighing his options. Sometime later, you park in front of the address he had given you. And now he's the murderer and he stabs me. Are you sure you're okay? Yeah, sure. A long silence. I'm sorry, I tried to. I thought I... I'm going to have to go home, back to my parents, talk to them.
His voice is faint, almost inaudible. I'm probably... Probably about to do something really stupid, huh? Probably. And you've been there too, haven't you? Yeah. We were an escort too? A lengthy silence, you hold his gaze. He senses you understand. Thanks. He gets out without a word. He hurries into the entranceway of a modern building already in bad repair, public housing. You start the cab. It took me so long to get it, and only that he told us that he's an escort and rang the bell that he was our suspect. I think I'm gonna drive him. Maybe he has another story to tell. I mean, he's a DJ. Okay, so that was a DJ. It was the same conversation that we already had, so... Oof. Oh no. Oh, I skipped everything. Oh well, doesn't matter. Take a few minutes to update your board with new clues. A bus goes by, making the walls shake. You take off your shoes. Okay, so this is the last night. Yes, it was him. <sighs> Okay, um, my biggest question for why Alexandra should be the killer is why would he kill the journalist if he if she could have helped him uncover the truth about the group Diamant. The thing is, I haven't considered, but someone else con took into consideration. Um, what if he killed the journalist because he, she was on his track? because she was about to find out who the Sandman was. Which would also explain why there were tears on the victim number three, because he didn't want to kill her. Okay, well, victim number four left money to his dog? Oh, okay, so victim number four is everything concerning Camille. A witness described killer as old man or woman. How is she an old woman? She's young. I mean, she doesn't necessarily look old too, so I guess that would bring him into the picture again. And also the female voice pretending to be male is kind of strange. Or does he just have a really strange voice? So the World War II gun probably goes belongs to him now, so... Ooh, I think that it was him now because really my biggest issue with him being the killer is why would he kill the journalist but I completely forgot that maybe the journalist was onto him the next question is like the office worker how did he find that out but I don't know I guess he has his ways victim for love money to his dog yeah just just for the sake of it so there's nothing here, so let's end the night. Let's see where that takes us. What I remembered is we drove a journalist who said that she would get someone to help us, to give us some information, but we never received that, did we? Or, do, or did I forget? It's always the same conversation, and oh, let's drive him. So, uh, again, magically, our taxi got filled up again. There's no, there's no one new now, so we can either drive Nari, Hervé, or the cursing lady. I guess she will just tell us the same story like she did the last time on our first drives. Okay, so that was it. It was another... She threw a lot of insults, like always, so I guess now it's time to drive him. Let's hope we don't screw up. So can we go there, please? I wonder what his explanation is going to be that he's attacked us. I guess it wasn't Jesus. You pull up to the sidewalk and wait for the suspect to exit the building. It's a hotel, not a very nice one. Heavy bars protect the windows, not that they need to, it doesn't look like they open. He must have come here after the fire. 
How many other survivors have been living and sleeping here for months on end? The back door opens and your passenger sits down. St. Louis Hospital, please. He's been drinking. The stench of booze settles in your cab. You nod and start driving. You ride along and your passenger doesn't look at you. He seems preoccupied, distracted by something outside. You're pretty sure the suspect doesn't recognize you. He's barely looked at you. You'd love to be able to read his mind to understand how he got to this point. How he can kill so methodically in cold blood. He looks like a nice grandfatherly type. Well, it seems like he doesn't kill in cold blood if he cries over the corpses. What if he's not the guy? Busset will make you pay. You almost jump at the sound of his voice. Change of plans. I need to go to 122 Rue de la Boétie. You raise an eyebrow. Um, are you sure? He finally looks at you. His voice is cold, almost too cold for someone who reeks so much of alcohol. Of course I'm sure. What a strange question. Um, there's no hospital there. I know, I know, I know, I know. No need to worry. He tries on a smile in guise of an apology. At the next intersection you change directions and drive away from the meeting point of the police. How can you fix this? Maybe you can drop your passenger off and then call Busset to explain? He might try to escape. What's he going to do on a Rue de la Boétie? It's a posh neighborhood with a theater, shops, office buildings. You clench your gut, there's something else on Rue de la Boétie. Oh no, someone's living there, right? Aren't the Groupe Diamant's headquarters somewhere nearby? Oh no. The Groupe Diamant, the company who was responsible for the fire. There's no way that's a coincidence, not a chance. You raise an eye to look in your rearview mirror and cross your passenger's gaze. Everything alright? His voice is clear, crystal clear, not the slightest alcoholic slur. You sober up fast. Yes, everything is fine. Sure, doesn't seem like it. You seem stressed out. His voice is different, his words, his way of speaking. Something has changed, you've almost reached your destination. Your tens up. I'm quite bothered. I'm worried about you, my friend. You freeze. You haven't slept much this week. What? You don't dare turn around. I think you've gotten a little too involved in this investigation. Oh, great. Why don't we make a deal? You tell me what you know and what you're planning tonight and I'll let you live. Out comes a weapon. You don't know where it came from, but now it's pointed right at you. One sign, one move, and you disappear, understood? You nod very slowly. Who do you work for? Would it make sense to tell him that I'm working for the group Diamant so he is not thinking that the cops are coming for him? I guess. Maybe. Let's just try. A look of disbelief crosses his face. Group Diamant. I know what's going on. How did they get ahead of the police files? Uh, a hold of the police files. He raises a hand to stop you from talking. A strange gleam appears in his eyes. You, you can get to Anita Ventimiglia, the CEO. You start to see how you might fix this. You might be able to get him to Busset's meeting point after all. You'll have to be clever. Manage to muddy the waters long enough that he doesn't realize what's happening. His deep voice booms through the cab. You arrive at his destination and double park your taxi. Maybe you can play into his desire for revenge to... You know where I can find Anita Ventimiglia? I know. He lowers his head. I have a deal for you. You drive me to her and I forget you exist. I let you go. You hold his gaze. Cross my heart. Well, you shot me already once, so hmm. It's a golden opportunity. You can make him think you're driving him to his next target, but drive him to the meetup with Busset instead. Okay. He smiles, barely, but nonetheless, he thinks he's won when it's really the other way around. She... she lives... I know where she lives. She's never there. She has a second home in the ninth arrondissement. That's where I meet with her. You know your way around the place? You know if there's a way to get into the parking garage, into her apartment? Yes, into the parking garage. Why are you working for her? I had no choice for the money. I had no choice. There's no other choice for dealing with this beast. 
She's a demon, you hear me? A monstrosity spawned by her own society. She screws up everything around her. He glances outside. Drive, take me there. His voice rolls off his tongue like a wave on a sea of oil. I'm going to watch her die, you know. I'll inject a low dose of bromide and cut the artery here, near the thigh. Oh wow, she'll bleed to death for half an hour, maybe more. I want her to feel herself dying. To dedicate the last minutes of her life to thinking about the people who died in the albatross fire. He's shaking, so is the gun in his hands. It almost looks like a toy. So, is it really already established that they burned down the house on purpose? That it was part, that it was the work of the group Diamant? Because now we found out that they were going to sell the building, so why would they do that now? But you know it isn't. I broke into your place, you know. Huh, so it was true. I saw your wall, your files. There were two possibilities, either you work for the cops or for the group Diamant. Between us, I'm surprised they don't have the money to hire a private detective. Yeah, well, they took a taxi driver. And all those police documents stolen, is that it? Yeah. Setting foot in your place was something else, you know. Not at all what I was expecting. And I saw you sticking your nose into things left and right. Each time I moved forward, there you were, sniffing around. I needed to know more about you. He freezes, shaking. You must think I'm a little nuts, right? Not more than just a little. He doesn't wait for a reply. They started killing because no one was doing anything. That journalist sold out to Diamant, the city hall woman, rotten to the core. Really? The journalist was sold out to Diamant? I thought that she was an upright journalist. That son of a bitch arsonist, I'm sure he's the one who set fire to the albatross. Even the old guy, he was just a stockholder like any other, willing to do whatever it takes to make a few thousand more. His voice becomes screechy. And let me ask you, what was it to him? He was already a millionaire. My life doesn't change when I find a penny in a gutter, does it? He was rolling in it for sure. He didn't manage his own money. Remain discreet. He didn't manage his own money. No, I don't know. You nod, this is no moment to disagree. I was a soldier, you know. Yes, you probably know that already, though. You checked up on me. Indochina. I was barely 20. They gave me a rifle and some bullets. They pointed to three guys in the field and said, those are our enemies, you have to kill them. So I killed them. He pauses. He watches a woman walking by outside. She's completely unaware. When I understood they were... When I discovered what we were fighting for, it was too late. And when I came back to France, I was treated like shit. No one gave a damn about us. He gags on his own words. What I'd like you to do is wait for me. I'll take care of her and leave. Cross my heart. After that, after her, I'm done. Done. What do you think? You're just a few minutes from your destination. You're starting to feel nauseous. What if you realize that you're leading him on? Okay. Good. Good. His gaze falls on his weapon. You're not far from the meeting point. One or two minutes max. You know where this gun comes from? I mean, before I got a hold of it? The Americans? The Germans? No idea. The Nazis? Hmm. After World War II, France got a hold of a lot of weapons. War reparations. Thousands of guns like this, rifles, tanks, cars, soldiers too. All those weapons though, I always found it strange to hold on to them. They should have been burned, destroyed. Yeah, then you probably wouldn't have been able to kill so many people. But they were given to soldiers like me, kids. I think they were afraid to give them to veterans. Imagine putting your hands on the gun you got shot with. He looks up. Her apartment much further? Just as he says those words, you turn into the alleyway. The headlights from the police cars flood your cab with bright light. Another car comes to block you in. A voice on a megaphone asks you to get out of the, ca out of the taxi. You open the door and throw yourself onto the ground, yelling, a door slamming. You turn around, two shots are fired. They ring through the alleyway, bounce off the walls, hurt your ear. Don't shoot! Ah, oh, they killed him too. Nice mess, huh? 
the lieutenant manages to fit twice as much cynicism as usual into her voice. Cops have only just let you back in your taxi. After shots were exchanged, they arrested Alexandra. No one was hurt. Oh, okay, they didn't kill him. No question about it, you screwed him over pretty good. I had no choice. Oh, I have absolutely no complaints, but he's not happy with you. She lets out a long sigh, so you have plenty of time to sit with your feelings. You betrayed his trust. A real nice mess. I've run into some crazy criminals on the job, but he's among the top three. He thought he was doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. He's convinced he's a hero. He's incapable of understanding the seriousness of his crimes. He thinks he's Robin Hood. She flashes a clear and honest smile. Anyway, you did good work on this case. I must admit, I'm a bit surprised. Impressed, even. Listen, you're no longer needed here. We got the tape, we have your statement. And we'll get his when he calms down. The cop flicks away an imaginary ball of fuzz on her leg. She throws the fuzz somewhere in your taxi. <laughs> Actually, if you could kindly get the hell out of here as soon as possible. Don't leave the country, obviously. I need you to be available if I have questions. But I no longer consider you a suspect. You're free to go. When was I ever a suspect? She puts her hand on the door. And what's the magic word? Go fuck yourself, yeah. She snickers before getting out of the car. He remained completely still, consumed with anger and exhaustion. A cop waves for you to back up. You start the taxi and pull out of the alleyway. The flashing lights, the cops, it all quickly vanishes. You speed through Paris. Not a soul on the road. Your forehead is running. You feel guilty about having lied to Alexandre. I don't. Uh, honestly. Between clenched teeth, you utter, he was a fucking murderer. Yeah, he was. And you start driving west, far from Paris, far from everything. We did it! Again. So, let's see... What this time... Who we can call this time, because this time we haven't driven the priest, so... Your kids are good. They grow up so fast, Adi shows me pictures sometimes, but I never go inside the house. It would be too complicated for everyone. But they're doing well. They look a lot like dad, at least I think. You pause. A truck flies by just meters from you. I thought when it was all over, I mean, I thought I'd be able to get some decent sleep. Close my eyes and sleep, really sleep, finally. Sleeping is just a break, it doesn't put an end to it, it all starts up again as soon as a voice cuts you off. Okay, yeah. Oh, okay, we can't talk to anyone else. So, it's the last chapter that we did, so I, th I just want to I just want to choose to disappear for now, I don't know. You start walking. With quick hands, almost mechanically, you toss your phone to the left and your car keys to the right. With each step you take, you feel freer, lighter. Just a few more steps and you'll disappear into the woods. The trees slowly part like they're letting you through. There's got to be something for you. Out there. Ooh, okay. So that was the disappearing part. Okay, now that was the last chapter. We did it. So, we didn't manage to meet all the customers. But I think we managed a lot. So, let's just take a look at it. Yeah, it, there's still some missing, but we, I think we managed to meet three quarters of all the guys, so that's something. Um, yeah, so still, my, my main criticism about it is that you have to go through various, like, new conversations over and over again with each new case. My biggest critique is still that those three cases are like parallel universes. That every case you have to start anew from the beginning and all the, the talks, all the conversations are the same with Bussy, with your boss, with um, seemingly also your other self that visits you on day three or something. So that can be a little tedious in the end. But yeah, I mean, I liked stories a lot. There would be a lot to to find out about Jerome, but sadly we only met him in the last chapter, so... 
I don't know. Yeah, that's that's also a little bit my problem. There are so many people that you meet, but you never know when you drive them if it's just gonna be a story that you already know or... Sometimes you can't even say something so much different. So I guess at in one drive, sometimes there aren't so many different outcomes possible so that you could unlock something else. So yeah. I like the concept a lot. It is a nice idea. The design is lovely. The design is really nice. The soundtrack is really good. So it really um, helps paint the general picture. So it, it really is fitting for the scenarios. The sad thing is because I really would like to, to meet all of the characters. Um, but the problem is that you never know when, when you're going to meet them. And since there's not really a free game mode where you can where you, where you can catch up with everything that would have been pretty nice though i don't know if it's possible i'm just gonna take a look because i think it's always linked to to a case because yeah random investigation the game will randomly pick an investigation no matter if solved or unsolved I would have really loved like a free driving mode or something where you can just go around and pick up everyone and not be bound to the story but you can really advance them if it's like an advancing story to see. Now we solved all three cases and I'm glad I did. I had some fun times and it was a nice game like overall. But that was it so far for Nightcall and Thank you for sticking with it. Thank you for joining me. And I hope you enjoyed it too. If you have recommendations for other games that are like this, please feel free to comment. And thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.